Hi, it's Dr. Risa E. Lewis dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adara Landry and I wrote. It's called Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book coming in 2024 by HarperCollins. Pre-order now, Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact, wherever you buy your books. It's the reason why I like being the person that gets to, to meet a person when they come in the ER, because they come in with all these emotions, all kinds of things. And it is, oh my gosh, I can't barely describe it when you see them fearful, angry, upset, scared, depressed, whatever. And just by listening to them, just like just sitting there and just being a calm presence in the room and just listening to them, you just watch them transform right in front of you. Everything about them changes. Their demeanor changes. They just decompress. And I love that. It's almost magical. I just enjoy that. Just to watch a person just go from 100 miles an hour down to a really manageable speed. And on their terms. This is the Visible Voices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Risa Lewis. In today's episode, I speak with emergency medicine physicians, Dr. Thea James and Dr. Kama Ennis. So I think the story, listeners, starts in 1997 when I first met Dr. Thea James. She's an emergency medicine physician at BMC, that's Boston Medical Center in Boston. Fast forward, I connected with Dr. Kama Ennis. And in fact, Kama and I trained at the same emergency medicine residency in Boston, albeit different years apart. Kama is a documentary filmmaker in addition to an emergency medicine physician, in addition to a lifestyle medicine physician. Kama and I met, we chatted, and we talked specifically about her documentary, Faces of Medicine. So Faces of Medicine is her attempt to, through stories, demonstrate to the world exactly what the state of medicine is. 2 to 2.8% of all physicians in the United States are Black women. Studies show that racial concordance between patients and physicians improves health outcomes. So both Kama and Thea are dedicated to health equity and changing the face of medicine, changing the face of medicine so that we can have better health for everybody. Kama, only 2% of all physicians in the U.S. are Black women. You've talked about this being a long game and your documentary, A Long-Term Project. You said that the first time you met a Black female doctor was in your last year of medical school. It was. uh, And I was really fortunate to meet Dr. Thea James, who was, of course, here as well, at Boston Medical Center during my first emergency medicine rotation as a medical student. And I'd gone to med school in New York, but I'd come up to Boston to do that rotation. And it was my first opportunity to overlap with a Black female physician and see somebody who looked like me in the space that I wanted to occupy and to see how she navigated the clinical space with myself and other students and residents just was incredibly impactful for me because I was one of those tunnel vision kids. I just sort of like, you know, halfway came out of the womb saying Dr. Ennis, but not because of examples. There were none in my family. There were none in my community. I saw my doctor once a year. So it wasn't as though I had sort of this image of what it would be. It just, it popped into my head in second or third grade and never left. And so seeing Dr. James at that point was just like, oh my God, like, I don't think I recognized not seeing myself reflected. And in recent years, having looked over some of the data around health equity that we've all become more familiar with for the longest time because I was in Boston to go to public health school. So inequity in health is no stranger to me. Recent studies have demonstrated that having a Black pediatrician can lead to a 50% reduction in the infant mortality rate for Black infants, which is more than twice that of white infants. And similar trends have been seen in other health outcomes when there's racial concordance between the patient and the healthcare provider. Kama, you are creating a documentary. And the title of the podcast is The Visible Voices. And the title of your documentary is Faces of Medicine. And in both works of art, creations that we're putting out into the world, there's an important role of storytelling. Faces of Medicine is all women, all Black, all doctors. 
It's a participatory documentary project centering on the path of Black female physicians in the United States. It's describing the current landscape of Black women in medicine and recognizing the trailblazing work of Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, the first Black female physician in the U.S., she who graduated from the New England Women's Medical College in 1864. And Thea is one of your guests, one of your interviewees. Tell us more about the storytelling and how you're shaping these stories of these women in healthcare. So Faces of Medicine came to be because I felt the need to change my own career path. And at that point, I was honestly considering very much at the point of leaving clinical medicine for various and sundry reasons, but didn't want to leave my hospital with only one Black female physician, which is what it would have been at that time. But it obviously does not make sense for one. One person cannot fill a gap in a systemic problem. And so to me, that I thought, you know, what we need is more Black female physicians. And how do we do that? How do you show somebody that they can be in this space, that this space, it belongs to them as well? And so what I wanted to do is tell stories because you can Google, you can look up a Black female physician and you can, and all you see is this, you know, academic pedigree that still looks just as unattainable as anything else. But when you actually hear a person's story and you hear about when they were a kid in the marching unit and you hear about when they saw their grandmother fall ill and you hear about how they just made it through the day to day and realize that this is not that different from anybody else's existence, it makes it attainable. That's what I want. I want for people to see themselves reflected in these stories, to know that this belongs to them if they want it there's a path, (laughs) you can do this. Because I think it's at 2.8% of physicians, there aren't that many of us. And so chances are, you know, that most folks will not have seen a Black female physician in person. I was 25, you know, if I hadn't been as stubborn as I was, I may not have ended up where I am now, but I don't want anybody to have to wait that long. Yeah. Speaking of medical training and medical education theory, you were talking about that we treat the disease. We're not treating the person. We're not treating the patient. And you've said medical education, the whole thing needs to be redone. So you have expressed that the foundation of that is teaching respect. So what are some of your other ideas of how we can do this? One of the things I think would be help is that we become more humble, that we give up the power, that we include subjects of our work, like the patients, communities, include them in co-creating the medical curriculum. Because, you know, when you look at all the data, when I think of all the data that um, has been collected, particularly when people study disparities, which are really downstream consequences of inequities upstream, people never do that work with some intentionality to close the gaps or anything. Also, when we see these data, we generally go into a room and sit down and make a plan, you know, some sort of intervention. And we're sure this plan pretty much about people who, whose existence and life experiences you have no idea about. But, you know, we, we, we go in these rooms and we do this. And that's also why nothing ever happens. Nothing ever changes. But what I have seen from experience here at our own hospital is we now like lead with the subjects of the data because two things happen. Number one, it's extremely efficient. You get them to interpret the data or interpret the problem and their perspective is the right perspective because it represents them. And the other good thing that happens is your intervention hits the nail on the head and you wind up being able to see a change in outcomes. We've been doing that. And not only that, it happens pretty quickly, pretty fast. And it mainly it happens fast because you've got the map. This is human-centered design, which is what I'm all about. We do so many of these topics on the Visible Voices. If you bring the patient, they'll tell you what's wrong. They'll tell you how to design it. They'll tell you why it's impossible to take a medicine four times a day. So do you have a specific example that you've worked on and it's been integrated either into the curriculum or into patient care? Just recently, not that long ago, it was actually the OBGYN department that gave us a model for how we were going to address disparities that we had identified across our entire hospital. And so they had identified a disparity in 
you know, serious maternal outcomes in, in women here. It was uh, mainly postpartum hemorrhage, and it was associated with preeclampsia. And so it was happening to black women at twice the, almost twice the rate of white women. And as they interrogated the data, which is the model, looking at the data, interrogating it back to root cause, the first thing they saw was its association with preeclampsia. And then, you know, of course, the treatment for that, obviously, in late pregnancy is delivering the baby. And then they saw in the data that the faster that decision was made, the less likely that outcome happened. And then they saw that the doctors were taking like twice as long to make that decision in black women. And so, you know, what they did immediately was to standardize that decision making process. They created an algorithm. And just from that, just doing that, the gap closed. I mean, for black women, the decision making time went from uh, 98 minutes to 50 minutes. For, you know, Hispanic women, I think it went from 88 to like 40 something. And then uh, they interviewed the patients. They interviewed the providers, the nurses, the midwives, everybody interviewing them to, again, interpret or add context to the quantitative data. And uh, they learned so many things from the patients. And so patients talked about what they wish they had. They wish that they could call the hospital or connect with somebody easily when they didn't feel well during the pregnancy and this type of thing. They wish they had more information about preeclampsia. They wish they had a chatbot, all of which we co-created with them. Chatbot was um, created with the questions that they, you know, they wish they had. We co-created videos, and you can clearly see the patients in the videos in terms of how they express and teach other patients, you know, about preeclampsia. And as a result of that, first of all, if you look at the data, bias was at the center. I can tell you that they've done a whole analytics thing on it. Our analytics team. It was mistrust on both sides. But the longer the short of that, we have uh, decreased readmission rates for preeclampsia postpartum by 19% in a year. And we're doing the exact same thing in diabetes. And that's going really, really fast. Even in six months, you know? So it's just really simple, really efficient, and just, you know, helps you get, again, hit the nail on the head and know exactly what you're doing to get the outcome that, that you're aiming to get. I'm Dr. Risa E. Lewis, dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adair Landry and I wrote. It's called Microskills, Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book being published in April of 2024 by HarperCollins. We believe every future goal, complicated task, and healthy habit can be broken down into simple, measurable, and tiny skills that you can practice and then excel by removing obstacles, overcoming assumptions, and maximizing your potential at work and in life. You can pre-order it now. Go to bookshop.org, amazon.com, or wherever you buy your books. So question for both of you. What's keeping you up at night these days? Kama, you take it first, then Thea. The healthcare system in this country is incredibly challenged and sort of inside out and upside down. I think, you know, what Thea was just talking about in terms of putting the patient and the community that we're serving at the center of it, that is incredibly important. And that's not how our system is largely designed. And, you know, I think that frontline providers, clinicians, physicians are feeling burdened in a way that is no longer outweighed by other circumstances of the roles, right? I think that there used to be a lot more safety in being a clinical person that doesn't exist right now. The The level of violence that's happening to healthcare providers is, is shocking. And the economic financial model of healthcare systems is not sustained. It's just not a sustainable one. We spend, you know, nearly twice as much as the next closest developed country and we get really grossly inadequate outcomes. And that worries me because when people leave the system, when the people who are relatively altruistic get into the system and then start leaving the system, I worry about our patients and our communities. What about you, Thea? I think what keeps me up at night is, you know, we're having all of these um, epiphanies, if you will. I don't know if I'd call it that really, but, you know, we are becoming a, a bit more evolved in understanding, generally, at least have an opportunity to understand what's wrong with the healthcare system. And and Kam was right. I mean, I've never seen a worse business model where you invest in something, 
spending more money than anyone else does. And, and the return on that investment is the opposite, you know, because our, our, our outcomes are like very low near the bottom. You know, I, I will just say like a lot of it is, uh, I'm going to say it's structural racism, quite frankly, because um, structural racism is expensive and it's a poor business model. And that's because a lot of it's driven by economics. And that is a hard, hard, hard narrative and mindset to disrupt because it's so deeply embedded in American culture. And so, you know, people just don't understand why there's these two distinct socioeconomic kind of populations, you know, and, you know, why it's so predictable who's going to do worse. And I would say that, you know, the the most successful strategic plan that was ever instituted in this country was redlining because it, uh, it was a perfect plan for economic exclusion. And, you know, people are going to prioritize survival. They can't prioritize health when they're prioritizing survival. And when they have limited resources and and they're blocked from the solution in most people's minds for people from disinvested communities who, you know, are not thriving, the solution is charity in the exclusively in perpetuity. You know, there's no return on that investment for sure. If those investments were being made in creating off ramps for people out of you know, poverty into being active, contributing citizens to the economy, you know, which helps everyone. It improves the GDP. You don't have to create a budget for subsidies. You know, if people would do that instead, it would be much better outcomes. The healthcare outcomes would be better. And not just like income and things like that, but the ability to build assets, you know, it's assets and generational wealth and those type things, which just that's the thing you need to sustain you during something like a pandemic when you're challenged in that way, you know, so that you don't fall off the cliff and that type of thing. So the way the system is designed is designed for people to have to prioritize their health. And in many cases, you know, giving them subsidies and in many cases, fortifying those subsidies with traps that penalize people when they try to get out of it, like the cliff effect. You know, so people turn down jobs and raises and all that type thing. So it's not complicated at all. You know, it's just not. But disrupting the the way people think about it, the dominant narrative and, you know, the mindset, that's where the problem is. So in my mind, I don't know if it keeps me up so much anymore because everything that I'm trying to do and committed to doing right now is the alternative to that. The alternative to creating those traps and things we're like releasing those traps and like having intentionality towards focusing on economic mobility, you know, for patients. And so if I stay awake at night, it's because I'm thinking about the next thing that we need to do around that. In addition to practicing your drumming. (laughs) Thea, you have been the recipient of many honors, many awards. And as I shared, I was delighted when you said yes to joining me on The Visible Voices. You're a legend. And I'm wondering of all the honors and acknowledgements that you've received, of what are you most proud? So I'm going to tell you this, you know, like I'm never comfortable with any of those things. I'm grateful. I am deeply grateful and really deeply appreciative. But I, you know, I am not a person who's comfortable with those things. And mainly because nobody does anything on their own, probably comma, and, 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 you know, creating, you know, the faces of medicine. Nope, not on my own. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done, I've, I've done nothing on my own. And I don't want to do anything on my own because I have no chance of having any success. You need all hands on deck, all minds, you know, at the table, you know, all perspectives at the table. Mentorship and stuff like that for me is a 360 degree thing. You know, I, I get it from behind me, above me, parallel to me. You know, I, I learn from everything from so many things. And so it's always a collective award in my mind. And that's how I accept them all on behalf of everyone else, you know, who's, who's, who's on the team. I like that 360 a lot. Kama, what award, acknowledgement, honor are you most proud? I don't know if I have a, you know, a specific gold star that makes me the most proud or a specific award. And like Thea, I have done nothing by myself. (laughs) Like I might have come up with an idea, but this is, it's all a team effort. It's all a group effort. And so 
I mean, Faces of Medicine has been an incredible journey and process and it's not done. And so I think what really got to my core was the fact that this is a completely donor supported project, right? Like I don't have the money to make a documentary series. (laughs) Let's just be clear about that. But the fact that people have believed in this work enough to donate the money to enable me and the team of folks who are, are putting this together to make it happen that makes me feel really good inside and actually coming to fruition with the first of the four episodes and knowing that people are still getting behind and supporting us with donations to complete the next three episodes. So that's, um, I think that's what I'm most proud of right now. Thea, your legacy. That I was fair and that I um, was always wanted for people what they wanted for themselves and was willing to go on the journey with them to achieve that with them or enable them to do it. But in my mind, you know, it's all about enabling people to be happy and at peace and thriving. What makes them happy, you know, what they want, you know, it's all about them. It's the reason why I like being the person that gets to to meet a person when they come in the ER, because they come in with all these emotions, all kinds of things. And it is, oh my gosh, I can't barely describe it when you see them I don't know, fearful, angry, upset, scared, depressed, whatever. And just by listening to them, just like just sitting there and just being a calm presence in the room and just listening to them, you just watch them transform right in front of you. Everything about them changes. Their demeanor changes. They just decompress. And, you know, it just, it's like a balloon and it's sort of just like, sort of, I don't know. If there's too much air in it, it sort of like decompresses a bit, you know. So, I mean, I, I, I love that. It's almost magical. I just enjoy that, you know, just to watch a person just go from, you know, 100 miles an hour down to a really manageable speed, you know, and on their terms. That's the best part of it, on their terms. Yeah. Kama, you and I know why Thea is one of the central figures to your documentary. And I think the listeners now understand as well for people want to hear more, watch more, support more, can you tell them where they can find you and uh, support? Absolutely. So facesofmedicine.org is the website uh, where you can learn a bit more about the documentary, the series, the plans, and there's a teaser that you can watch. We are also coordinating live screenings. And so there's a form if you'd like to host a live screening, uh, just reach out, let me know, and we'll be putting together some virtual screenings as well for folks to be able to take a look. But you can sign up for the monthly newsletter and uh, you can support if you'd like. The Risa Wrap Up. Special thanks to Thea and Takama for joining me in conversation. A conversation I 150,000% relished. Some take-home points, audience. Well, you heard it directly from Thea and for Kama. Structural racism in medicine and in medical education is alive and thriving. And there are things that we can do to do better. Number one, human-centered care, patient-centered care. You heard it from Thea. She said, why don't we bring patients to the table and help us design medical education and medical curricula? Number two, the data is strong and it speaks that racial concordance makes a difference when it comes to health care and health outcomes. So we all should be motivated to create better equity with access to education, medical education, and to becoming a healthcare worker, specifically a doctor. Finally, Kama, Thea, and many other visible voices that you hear on this podcast are here to make a difference. They're on this earth. They're trying to make things better. They're trying to improve the safety, the well-being, and the health of everyone. That's all I have for you this week, audience. See you next time. The Visible Voices podcast amplifies voices both known and unknown, discussing topics of healthcare, equity, and current trends. We are a production of the People's Media Network. Our team includes Dr. Giuliano DePorto and me, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. Please find me on social media at Risa E. Lewis and through the website, thevisiblevoicespodcast.com. If you like the podcast, please rate and review us. Share the podcast with a friend today. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, to be continued.